Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. I've talked about all manner of scams on this channel, and occasionally the feds catch them. And that's always good news. The DOJ, Department of Justice, announces they just busted eight people for the infamous grandparent scam. The grandparent scam. This is one I've talked about briefly, but it's a typical phone scam where someone calls you on the phone, tells you something is not true, they claim they're somebody who they're not, and they try to get money from you. And this is where they pretend to be your grandchild. So this one wouldn't work on everybody, but it works on some people. And I've heard about this happening to people. So you need to know if you've got anyone in your family uh, who has grandchildren, who has a cell phone, who might fall for this. Listen up. Eight indicted in nationwide grandparent fraud scam. The news release from the Department of Justice out of the Southern District of California. Eight people charged in a federal grand jury indictment unsealed this week accused of participating in a criminal enterprise that's stolen millions of dollars from elderly victims around the nation. According to a statement made by prosecutors, the defendants swindled more than $2 million from 70-plus elderly victims across the nation. At least 10 were in San Diego County. By feeding them phony stories that their grandchildren were in terrible trouble and needed money fast. This scheme has left many elderly victims financially and emotionally devastated, said U.S. Attorney Randy Grossman. It is unconscionable to target the elderly and exploit their love for their grandchildren. Elder fraud is a serious crime against some of our nation's most vulnerable citizens. We are committed to combating all types of elder abuse in our community. These defendants were part of a large network of individuals that systematically targeted elderly Americans by preying on their concern for loved ones. The Department of Justice is committed to prosecuting individuals who take part in such schemes that target vulnerable people, says De Deputy Assistant Attorney General Aaron Rao for the Civil Division's Consumer Protection Branch. We are grateful to our partners in the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, and the FBI in advancing the department's efforts against organized elder fraud and to the San Diego County District Attorney's Office. This is the first case investigated by the San Diego Elder Justice Task Force, which is a collaboration between the U.S. AG, the FBI, and the District Attorney's Office, and all San Diego County law enforcement agencies. It was established in February 2020 and is believed to be the first comprehensive law enforcement effort for this purpose anywhere in the country. Uh, this is a massive and growing problem as our country's population gets older with losses into the billions of dollars nationwide, says FBI Special Agent in Charge Suzanne Turner. The San Diego Elder Justice Task Force was set up to combine resources, experience, and capabilities to have a sophisticated and coordinated law enforcement response to fight this battle. So what we're talking about here is the perpetrators would contact elderly victims, usually by telephone, and impersonate a grandchild or someone else close to the victim. The scammer pretends to be in dire legal trouble because of an accident or arrest. He or she claims to need money for bail, medical expenses, or legal fees. Now, the scheme actually involves actors who play varying roles using a well-rehearsed script. One would play the beloved relative. Another would pretend to be a lawyer. Still, others might pose as bail agents or medical professionals. They provided victims with a false case number, and they instructed the victims to lie to family, friends, and bank representatives about the reason for the withdrawal or money transfer. And this is a variation on one that goes way back, way back. And I remember over 10 years ago, flying someplace, and it just sticks in my mind because of the timing. I was flying someplace, so I shut my phone off while the plane was in flight. As we landed, we're on the ground, I turned my phone back on, and the first email I get is from a friend of mine, and it says, Steve, this is embarrassing. Um, I traveled to Europe but didn't tell anybody. And while I'm here, someone stole my passport and all my money. And I can't really call my friends or family because that would be embarrassing. Can you help me out? I just, I just need a few thousand dollars. And I'm looking at this going, the only reason I got this email is I'm in this guy's email address book and someone hacked his email account. Because this is a guy I hadn't spoken to in two years. And I said he's a friend of mine. He would know who I was if we ran into each other in the street. But we didn't talk often. And it was more of a professional acquaintance thing. And I remember looking at that going, that's, that's just goofy. And I, still, I discarded it. But what they did back then is they would hack into somebody's Gmail account by guessing the password, I'm guessing. And then they would send the email to every single person. And if one person responded, it made it worth their while. And I got 
other variations on this where I'm sitting in my office, I'm going through my email, and there's one that says, oh, I'm stranded in London, I'm stranded in Paris. Uh, but this one here is they're targeting older people and they're guessing that the older person is going to have either a grandson or a granddaughter or maybe a niece or a nephew that they might not have seen in a while. And I know people who've got so many descendants, they might not be able to keep them all straight. So someone calls them and goes, yeah, I'm your grandson, Joseph. You might have one, you never know. You know, so the grandparents were so fearful and desperate to help that they hand over tens of thousands of dollars in tremendous acts of selflessness. Once the victim was on board, other members of the criminal enterprise were dispatched to doorsteps to collect the money. We're going to send someone to your house to pick up the money. According to the indictment, the scammers took elaborate steps to conceal their true identities from victims and law enforcement by using false names. They actually rented residences to receive cash sent through the mail and commercial carriers. They used rental cars or rideshare vehicles to pick up funds from victims. And once they received funds from victims, the scammers quickly tried to hide it by transferring proceeds to other members of the conspiracy who converted the currency to cryptocurrency. And by that, they were hoping they'd be harder to trace as well. Now, interesting thing about this is the red flag should come up when someone calls you and says, hey, look, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble. I'm in another country. I need money fast. And you say, okay, I'll help you. How do, how do I get the money to you? Someone's going to come by the house and pick it up. Wait, you need money fast and can't get it where you are, but you can get a runner to come to my house and pick it up this afternoon? Seems to me like you're pulling the wrong strings. If you can make that happen, but not the cash. And unfortunately, when they call and say, look, this is your granddaughter, your grandson, your niece, your nephew, uh, a lot of times because they want to help out relatives and they got the money, uh, they're, they're letting their guard down a little bit. But the obvious red flag there is that they are going to send someone over to get the money and don't tell anybody. Now, here's the thing. I understand that some people might actually understand the notion that let's suppose I'm, the, I'm, I'm a real grandson. I actually am a grandson of somebody's, okay? <laughs> and I am traveling in another country and I get arrested for something stupid. I might call somebody and say, hey, look, can you help me out? Don't tell anybody. But the person I call and ask that of is going to be somebody I trust very, very much. They know who they are. I know who they are. And beyond that, that wouldn't get out. Ask yourself when you get this phone call or talk to your loved ones about this. When someone says, can you help me out? Don't tell anybody. Ask yourself, would you be the one they'd be calling for that? That is the top secret favor? Because that's usually a problem also. According to documents, one defendant collected $33,000 from three different victims in a single day. Messages from the phone reveal that he's provided victims' names and addresses and used a fake name to collect money from the victims. In a text exchange with a co-conspirator, the defendant asked, uh, what's going to be my name? G-O-N, what's going to be my name? According to the indictment, one of the victims lived in Oceanside. She's 87 years old and is identified in the indictment as J.D. She received a phone call on May 11th, 2020 from a woman claiming to be her great, uh, excuse me, her granddaughter. The caller said she had been arrested following a car accident and needed $9,000 for bail. She then turned the phone over to her supposed lawyer who warned the woman not to discuss this with anyone or risk violating a court gag order. <laughs> Why would there be a gag order on posting bail money for somebody? A courier then went to JD's address and picked up the cash. The next day, a man claiming to be an accident specialist called JD and claimed that the other party in the vehicle collision had lost her baby as a result of the accident. If JD did not provide another $42,000, her granddaughter would be charged with first-degree manslaughter and spend 15 to 20 years in prison. JD sent a wire transfer the amount of $42,000 to an account associated with the defendants. And then the scammers thought, hey, we got a live one here. So they kept going. About a week later, another scammer called JD and advised her that she and her granddaughter had violated the gag order. Shouldn't have done that. If JD didn't pay an additional $57,000, her granddaughter would go to jail. JD sent another wire transfer the amount of $57,000 to an account associated with the defendants. Now, Grossman 
says, I know some victims may be reluctant to come forward because they feel embarrassed that they fell for the hoax. But I want to assure victims that is not your fault. You are one of many, many people who are deceived by a sophisticated criminal organization whose members concocted a number of plausible storylines and conspired together to trick you. These are unscrupulous manipulators who prey on the elderly. They are to blame, not you. So they do say that if you are contacted by scammers, you should uh, know that law enforcement is here to help. Call your local law enforcement agency, sheriff, FBI, or 911 if there's an emergency. And meanwhile, here's the thing. If someone calls you and asks you for money, says your car was found burning on the border and you're going to be arrested and your social security number is going to be shut off, um, call somebody and double check. Call an attorney. And the idea that, no, you can't make any phone calls. I can't think of any situations where you legitimately couldn't make any phone calls unless, I suppose, a kidnapper called. So we've got, you know, we're holding somebody. If you call anybody, we're going to do bad things to them. But that's actually not the scam they run here, <laughs> strangely enough. So just uh, to point this out, I'll tell you where the various defendants were located. So Orlando, Florida, Pembroke Pines, Florida, North Hollywood, California, uh, North Hollywood, California, Levine, Arizona, Hollywood, Florida, Paramount, California, and Orlando, Florida. So these people were scattered all around the country. And remember, it was a rather sophisticated scheme in that they had several people involved in each scam. So you get the phone call and they go, hey, is this grandma? Yes, it is. Well, well, I'm your granddaughter, um, Bailey, uh, and, and I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I'm, I'm actually in jail right now. They're letting, I'm, I'm, they're letting me, uh, I'm using a cell phone of my attorney. That's why you don't recognize the number. And um, I'm going to hand the phone to my attorney right now. And he's going to explain to you what's going on because I'm in a lot of trouble. And then there's another, there's a person there posing as an attorney. And, and then when the attorney says, hey, you know, we need the money. Can you, can, you, can you come up with the money today? If you say yes, the attorney then says, oh, I can get someone to come by the house and pick it up. That's a third person who's going to come by the house and pick the money up. And so they've actually got a bunch of people who are working on this. It's, it's you know, I, I, I will get this comment below. I'm going to make it now and kind of blunt the fun for somebody. Um, but if people put this much effort into a real job, they might actually make money. The amount of work that goes into these scams, I, I guess you make more money scamming people. But the point is that, that some of these people are working hard at scamming people. It's like, why not go and get a real job? <laughs> so in case you're curious about the charges... Uh, Title 18 U.S.C. Section 1962, Sub D. Conspiracy to conduct or participate in an enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity. Racketeering activity. Uh, it sounds a lot like RICO, which we don't hear about that often. In real life, we often hear it threatened. But in reality, this might be because it's a bunch of people acting in a criminal conspiracy, which is exactly what RICO is designed to go after. By the way, the maximum penalty here is 20 years in prison. And a fine of not more than greater than twice the amount of gain or loss or $250,000. So um, twice the loss or two fifty. dollars Take your pick. Uh, agencies involved in this, by the way, uh, involve all kinds of Department of Justice, FBI, Elder Task Force, Police Department, Sheriff Department, Carlsbad Police, Chula Vista Police. Uh, National City Police Department, Coronado Police Department. The list is almost endless, although it is you know, confined to a single page, so I guess it's not really endless. But as with the other scams I've talked about in this day and age, you might not fall for it. I wouldn't fall for it. Funny part is, I'll tell you right now, that I've put some fair, fairly, fairly good blocks on my various phones. And um, the funny part is that one of the screening systems I've got will screen calls, and if they don't come out right, it'll basically dump someone into a voicemail. And I never get notified the call was made, but I will, I will get up, I will get the voicemail. I got one yesterday that was like that. My phone recognized it as spam, but somehow dumped them into the voicemail. And it actually said, uh, it was a computerized voice, and all I heard was, if you do not call now, you will be arrested. <laughs> I thought, ah, I wanted to talk to those people. Because <laughs> apparently I'm about to be arrested. So you need to think who in your circle of friends and family might fall for something like this. 
because it's unfortunate they are targeting the elderly. And they're doing it because the elderly often have money, they often got a bunch of grandkids, and they often would help somebody who is in trouble. And when somebody calls them and they're not busy and they answer the phone and someone tells them a sob story, their knee-jerk reaction is to believe it. And, and there are people out there whose tendency is to believe something until it's proven false. Now, as you might know, I'm a skeptic. I tend to disbelieve almost everything until it's proven true. But when someone calls you on the phone, all bets are off. You don't know who they are. And you need to get that point across to the loved ones in your life who might be targeted by such a scam. So this is good news. Eight people indicted. It's a national news. These eight will be dealt with. And hopefully, as word gets out about this, this type of scam won't work as well in the future. So Keith sent it to me. Thanks a lot. The story is from the Department of Justice's own press release. Eight indicted in nationwide grandparent fraud scam. And the good news is that they are facing up to uh, 20 years in prison and some rather large fines. Questions or comments? Put them below. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Because in the end, you won't remember the time you spent working in the office or mowing your lawn. Go climb that mountain.